1 Samuel chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped in Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. I don't know if anybody in this room has ever been faced with a difficult situation. Chances are that everybody in this room has faced major crisis or has gone through very difficult things. In our passage this morning, Israel is prepared to go to battle with the Philistines, an enemy that has been a formidable enemy and considered a strong and great enemy. But my question to you this morning would be, how do you respond when you go into battle? How do you respond when you go into great crisis? Or how do you respond when you're faced with a great and difficult challenge? And what role does God play in all of it? See, the way that we view God in our lives will determine how we respond to crisis. To many of us, it can appear that God is a genie or a gimmick to bail us out in the time of need when faced with a difficult time. When I, as you, some of you know that I have a life that was previous life full of addiction and a lot of times I would find myself in situations where I was begging God to set me free but yet I was using him as a gimmick. Lord, if you just do this for me, I promise I will. And then as soon as the Lord comes through, I put him right back on the shelf. How do we respond to crisis? And what role does God play in, in our lives? We see here right away in verse 1 that the Philistines are encamped and the Israelites are now encamped and they're preparing for battle. It tells us here in verse 1 that the Israelites went out to fight battle against the Philistines. You know what's interesting about the Philistines other than being the place where, uh, the, where Goliath was from. A, he is a Philistine who was nine feet tall. We all know he was a Philistine. But other than that, we, we know that the Philistines have been a very good, great enemy against the Israelites. The Philistines were an immigrant people from a military aristocracy in the, from the island of Crete. In, I'm, in Amos chapter 9, verse 7, it says, And you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O children of Israel? Says the Lord, did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Syrians from Kerr? See, the Philistines had great Greek military equipment. They introduced helmets and shields and chained mail armor, swords and spears, making the Philistines a more formidable enemy. They were a strong opponent for Israel. And the Philistines were the first people in Canaan, in the land of Canaan, to process iron, and they made the most of it. They had become a serious threat to the Israelites. When we look in the book of Judges, you will see that it's the Philistines that were the constant enemy that would bring them into captivity. And we see here that, that the Philistines have now made a base camp in a city called Aphek, right along a river. And they're about two miles away from the Israelites. And now it tells us in verse 2 that the Philistines put themselves in battle array. They begin to build, they put their armor on and their helmets and their shields and their spears. And, and they were getting ready to attack Israel. The city of Ebenezer where the Israelites were encamped in and the city of Aphek where the Philistines were encamped in was about a two mile distance. So at times they were able to see one another and now the Philistines are beginning to array themselves. They're ready to set themselves in battle in order against 
the Philistine, against Israel. And it tells us here in verse 2 that they join together in battle. Now, I don't know if we're ever prepared for a great battle, especially when our enemy looks formidable. When they're dressed in battle array and we can look at the very appearance of our enemy and say, it doesn't look very well. And again, the way we respond to crisis or the way we respond to battle will give us a good indicator of how God is played out in your life. And we see here that as the Philistines are now in battle with the, uh, with the Israelites, it tells us here in verse 2, when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. So as they go into battle, we see that they join together in battle and, and Israel suffers a great defeat. They lose 4,000 men in battle in a battlefield. But when we look at this closer, when we take a more close look at this passage here, we can notice something pretty obvious. It's really easy to pass over on these pages, just as much as it's easy to pass over in life. The very obvious, they never sought the Lord. During this time, Samuel was the priest and the prophet of God, and they never sought him. They never sought the Lord to ask him, Lord, what direction would you have us go in this battle against the Philistines? We, we are children of God, and you will direct us. What, Lord, according to your word, what would you have us do? But we notice here that they never sought the Lord. And oftentimes we can do the very same thing when we're going into battle. We don't seek the Lord. We don't inquire with his word. We don't spend time in prayer. We never spend time seeking the Lord. And, and a lot of times the Lord will become a fourth, fifth, or sixth option. The result of this was 4,000 men died in battle. They were killed. But in verse 3, we, we look at an interesting response by the people of Israel, by the elders. It tells us that when they had come back to camp, to, to Aphek, where they had, were getting prepared for battle, they come back and the elders begin to make a statement. The, the elders say, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Why? Why, Lord, when I call upon you that you don't answer me? Why, Lord, when I'm going through this crisis, you don't seem to hear what I'm calling out to you? Why, Lord, have we lost 4,000 men in the battlefield? Why, Lord, why? Well, why would God be involved in something he was never invited in? Why would the Lord be invited or, or thinking that the Lord was going to do something when we never alone sought him out for direction? And oftentimes, this is where we can face defeat, where we expect to have God there for us, but we have no demonstration of living for the Lord. We're Christians by name only, and, and during these times, we go through a crisis or go through difficulties, and, and we try to say, Lord, where were you? Didn't you know I was going through this? Didn't you know I was going through that? Why didn't you deliver me? And the Lord says, who are you? See, when we go through difficult times, it will determine how big our God is in our lives. Is he a gimmick or is he the Lord God Almighty? Why were we divided in, in battle? You know, oftentimes we see, we see people do the same thing. We, they're never seeking the Lord in, in our marriages. The Lord's never sought in our relationships or in our business ventures or in our finances, or especially in crisis, the Lord's never sought out. And then we, when we get defeated or when we lose, we, we begin to blame God. God, where were you? Why were we defeated in battle? Where were you, God? Don't you hear me? This was the expectation from the Lord when the Lord was never, ever sought out. But what's interesting here is that the Lord is never sought out before battle. 
The Philistines are, I mean, the Israelites are leaning on their own understanding. They begin to, to say, what, why has the Lord done this to us? But you know what? We're going to come up with our own solution. And this is where it's dangerous. Because in Jeremiah, the Bible tells us that our heart is desperately above all, uh, is, uh, is, is uh, deceitful above all things and wickedly desperate. And oftentimes when we're in battle or going through a difficult crisis or we're going through things, we tend to look inward for our direction. And here we're going to see the, uh, the Israelites do the same thing. Instead of reaching out to the Lord after this defeat, they begin to come up with their man-made solutions. Decisions that are made without God. Plans that are made without God. And what's interesting here is that they never, before the battle, never sought the Lord. And now they blame God for their defeat. And now they come up with their own solution. Which is a recipe for disaster. And we see their solution here in verse 3. Look what it says in the second part of verse 3. Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. This is their solution. After losing 4,000 men, they say, let us get this ark. And I'll explain in a few moments what this Ark of the Covenant is. And let's take it before us. And when we can take it before us in the battle, this, this will deliver us in battle and it will save us from our enemies. You know, the concept in ancient times during these times was that any, uh, any tribe or anybody going to battle, what they would typically do is they would take their deity before them into battle. And it would give them the, the idea that their God is with them and, and will protect them during battle. And this was a concept in the ancient times that this would protect them and they would turn their people into vic being victory in their battles or in their fights. But I wanted to point out something here very briefly and I want to compare it quickly to verse 4. Because again, this shows us how the Israelites viewed God versus how the writer here views God. And again, it's how we view the Lord in our lives will determine how we respond to battle. When you see here in verse 3, when referencing the Ark of the Covenant, it tells us here in verse 3, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. That's the view that the Israelites had in taking their God into battle. But when you look at verse 4, when the writer describes the Ark of the Covenant, it tells us here, that they may bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherub. The writer here in verse 3 is describing and it reflects how the people viewed the Ark of God. They viewed it as a good luck charm or a gimmick to win a battle against the Philistines. And again, the way that we view God is the way we will approach our battles. It's the way that we will respond in crisis. It's the way we will respond in difficult times in our marriages or in our relationships or when it comes to finances. The way we respond will determine how we view our God. And is he viewed in your life as Jehovah God or is he viewed in your life as a gimmick? You know, when I was in jail, which is, I know... It's hard for you guys to believe that. Such a saint that I am. If you've ever been in jail, you know their bunks are like being in coffins. They're stacked like... And I was in jail. What I would do is I would put a Bible underneath the bunk that was above me. And I would pray to the Bible. And I'd say, Lord, if looking at the word of God, looking at the Bible, if you get me out of jail here, I promise you, if you get me through addictions, keep me clean, when I get out, I promise I'll follow you. And I was, I've never opened the Bible, I would just pray to it. And I was using the Bible as God's word, I was using that as a gimmick. Lord, get me out of here, and I promise I will follow you. 
Well, as soon as I get out of jail, I, I put God back on the shelf and I was like, I don't need you until I'm in trouble again. And oftentimes we have that same viewpoint of the Lord. And again, in the way that you will respond to difficult times will determine who your God is. Now, reminder with the, the Ark of the Covenant, it was a representation of God's throne here on earth. And it was kept in a large tent called the tabernacle. And within that tabernacle, it was a place where the priest of God would offer sacrifices to the Lord for the people. And within that tabernacle, there was another room called the Holies of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant of God, of the Lord of hosts who the cherubim dwell between, would be at. And only once a year, the high priest would go into this Holies of Holies and offer sacrifices. Nobody was to see this Ark. Nobody was to approach it. And now the elders, they want to take this and they want to use it for victory over the Philistines. It's not suggesting here that God is powerless. It's suggesting here that they're using the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord as a gimmick for them to win a battle. And it will be spelled out here in a few moments. But it was God who instructed the priest to make of the Ark of the Covenant. In Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 22, we'll give you a description of how the Ark was to be made. And in that Ark were to keep the different things, a, a jar of manna from when the children of Israel were in the wilderness. The Ten Commandments that God, a second pair of Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses. And Aaron's staff that is budding with olive leaves were to be kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. And it had these cherubs that were on top, cherubims that were on top, and it was called the mercy seat. And that's where the presence of God would dwell. He told the children of Israel, I will be your God and you will be my people. When you look at Numbers chapter 7, verse 89, now when Moses went into the tabernacle of meeting to speak with God, or him, he heard the voice of one speaking from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. Thus he spoke to them. This is how God would speak to Moses and to the people. This is how God would speak to the priests. And his presence was there. But you notice in verse 3 how they reference the ark of the covenant. They come up with the solution of why has God defeated us? Why has he, why do we lose 4,000 men? But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and we're going to go into battle. And when we go into battle, we're surely going to have victory. But look what it says in verse 3 again. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. Now I want you to notice the language here. That when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of of our enemies. Religion, methods, objects can never deliver us from anything, only our Almighty God. And by the language that you're using here, that the writer's using here, that in reference to what they're saying, they're seeing it as their Savior. You notice again that it says, when it comes among us, that it may deliver us from the hand of our enemies. There is nothing, nothing, or no it that can ever replace the work of Jesus Christ. Here, they're looking as the Ark of the Covenant, what, this, what they should have said, that when God comes among us, that God may save us from the hand of our enemies. They're looking to an object to deliver them from the Philistines. They're looking at religion or rituals or, or methods to deliver them rather than seeking God. We will never have victory in our lives over anything if we look to things rather than to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, when, uh, when I first started coming here about 16 years ago, you know, I was all on fire for the Lord. And so I had stickers all over my car. I had not of this world sticker. I had uh, uh, a man on the back window, a cross, and a man 
you know, kneeling and praying. I, was, I wanted my car to be the Jesus mobile, right? I wanted to put stickers on there. To, I wanted everybody to know I was a Christian until somebody cut me off on the freeway. The, the, just boom, it just, you know, the, the, you got, I, I know you guys have never been cut off, so I know you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Or someone waving to me, but it's just one finger, it's not a hand. And, you, and, and I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking to a gimmick to try to show people who I really am, but it's stickers or a, a shirt that says not of this world is not going to, is not going to have victory in our lives. It's only through Jesus Christ. And I, and I kept, I would fool myself so much because I was using objects and, and I was using methods to, to have God deliver me or to portray a certain way to the people because when really in reality, my heart was corrupt. And religion, gimmicks, or methods will never, ever save us or deliver us from an enemy. We all know it's only Jesus. It's only Jesus who sets us free. There is no thing in my life that has ever, ever set me free from addiction. There's no thing in my life that has never set me free from the bondage that I was involved in. It was, not, it was never an it that delivered me. It was only Jesus Christ. And the crazy thing is here that they never sought the Lord. And they were relying on the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. They were relying on that object. They were relying on works and methods. Because they said, let us bring the Ark of the Lord of the Covenant out. And this is what answers their why. Why has the Lord defeated us? Well, the Lord defeated us today because he was not with us. So let's take the Ark of the Covenant. We're not going to even seek the Lord. We're not going to seek the priest or, 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 the, or the prophet. We're just going to grab this Ark and we're just going to take it into battle. They never sought the Lord and taken the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the two cherubim. They were using it as a gimmick. But there have been times in the Old Testament when the ark of the covenant of the Lord went into battle. When you look at Joshua chapter 6 verses 6 through 8, the ark was in front of the marchers when they marched around the city of Jericho. The ark went in front of the marchers of, of Jericho and Joshua. Moses told the priest to lead the ark into battle against the Midianites in Numbers chapter 31. Later on, King Saul brought the ark into battle in 1 Samuel chapter 14, as did, as did David in 2 Samuel chapter 11. So there have been times where the, it was instructed of the Lord to take the ark into battle. But here, they never sought the Lord. The Lord never instructs the elders to do this. And, and the reason is that it may save us from the hand of our enemies. That's what verse 3 tells us. The elders, they had a nice sense that God, God they needed God's help to win this battle. They, they knew that the Philistines were a, a great enemy. But they were wrong in the way they did it. Instead of humbly repenting and seeking God... They turned to a method that God never approved. They believed that the presence of the ark would make God work for them and that this it may save them from the hand of our enemies. It's no doubt that it seemed like this brilliant suggestion when it came to the people, especially when they're, when they're asking, why did this happen to us? Of course this seemed like a brilliant suggestion. But the thing missing from here is that God was never sought. So many times I have used the Lord as a gimmick, you guys. I'm just being honest. My strong enemy, addiction. And I tried so many different methods and objects and things and religion to try to win the battle over drug addiction, but it never worked. The battle in relationships that I would struggle with I would try to answer my question, why? Why has I broken up? Why have they broken up? Why, why is this going on? The question of finances, why this and why in that? And instead of going to the Lord, I, I begin to start seeking out my own methods, my own ways. And oftentimes, maybe there was not 4,000 men that were died on a field, but my heart felt like it was under a great slaughter. 
Psalm 18, 17 says, he delivered, my, he delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. The only thing or the only person that will ever deliver us from our enemies is Jesus Christ. The only person that will deliver us from bondage and addiction is Jesus Christ. The only person that will set us free from anything in our lives that is hindering us from our walk with Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ. There is nothing else that can deliver us. There's no method. There's no gimmick. There's no rub your heels three times and God will magically appear. And when we look in verse 4, it tells us, So the people that sent to Shiloh that they may bring the ark from there, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. This is interesting. So the ark of the Lord has been in, Eb has been in, in uh, Shiloh. And now they want to bring it to this place where they just lost in battle between Aphek and Ebenezer. And they want to come in, they want to get this ark, and they want to bring it. And what's interesting here is the Bible doesn't describe how the ark was brought here, but God has very specific instructions in how the ark is handled. Because it was considered such, he, because his presence dwelled there, it was considered very holy. But the Bible doesn't tell us here, all it tells us is that the ark came into the camp. But at the end of verse 4, it tells us something here pretty tragic. It tells us, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. They were overseeing the Ark. They were the priest of the Ark. But what's so strange about this is that when we look back at these two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, their dad is Eli. He, their dad is the priest of God that would offer sacrifices for the people in the holies, of holies in, the, in, in the tabernacle, before the, God, before the Lord and for the people. So he was the priest of Shiloh. Very significant role. And his two sons. When we first meet his sons, or they're first mentioned, it's in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3, where the Bible just doesn't give them very big notice. It just simply tells us that they're the priest of the Lord. But when you look in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, we learn more about their character. We learn that their conduct, they're considered worthless men, and that they did not know the Lord. And when you look at chapter 2, verse 17 of 1 Samuel, it tells us that their sin was very great among the sight of the Lord, and that, they, and that men treated their offering of contempt, treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. These men were so wicked that people's hearts were turned away from the Lord. These men slept with the women who worked in the tabernacle, cleaning the, 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 the furniture to bring glory and honor to the Lord. These men were ripping off the sacrifices that were offered to the Lord. They were going by the camps and taking their forks and plunging them into the water and taking out what was supposed to be offered to the Lord as a burnt offering. They took those for themselves. They were corrupt and they did not know the Lord. And these were the men that verse 4 tells us that were overseeing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. How much worse can it get? We read in verse 5 that when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp. So it doesn't tell us how it was transported, but it was brought in. Later on in chapter 6, if you ever read 1 Samuel, a hint for you guys to come to Tuesday morning Bible study, we're going through 1 Samuel. And there were people who looked at the ark and were struck, killed, dead. So I don't know how the ark was transferred over, but it tells us here in verse 5 that when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp of Israel, it tells us that they shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now I don't know if you guys have ever been somewhere where the earth literally shakes. It's not referring to an earthquake here. It's referring to such a loud celebration that it shook. People were going wild. For all you people who are 
a little older would remember game one of the World Series. I think it was in 1988, the Dodgers were playing the Oakland A's. Now, when I mention World Series, I know you Angel fans probably won't necessarily know what that means. So just bear with me. Game one of the World Series, it's the bottom of the ninth inning. Dennis Eckersley is pitching for the Oakland A's. He's their, he's their closer. And, and, and uh, in a dramatic fashion, the Dodgers are down by one run in the bottom of the ninth. And Kurt Gibson comes and, and he pinch hits. He had two strikes against him. He had guys on base. Bottom of the ninth, game one of the World Series, and he hits a home run. And I spoke to somebody who was there, and they said that the place shouted so loud that Dodger Stadium literally shook. And this is what happened here. When the people saw the Ark of the Covenant coming in, the camp, the earth where they were at shook. And, and when the earth shook, The Philistine says, what is going on? You know, somebody passing by that camp right there would say, that's a tremendous church service that's going on over there. This would be considered a great church service because many would think that Israel really trusted God, but for all the appearances, it was really nothing because they were looking for this ark to deliver them from the hands of their enemies. All the noise and the excitement meant nothing because it wasn't grounded in God's word. It wasn't grounded in God's truth. And the Israelites probably felt that they were better than the Philistines because the Philistines were pagans and, and they were worshiping a false god named Dagon. But weren't the Israelites acting just as the Philistines as pagans? Thinking that they could manipulate God and force him to do whatever they want him to do? Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 says, Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he, shall, he will also reap. For he, no, for he who sows to the, his flesh will, of the flesh will reap corruption, and he who sows to the Spirit will reap everlasting life. So we see here in verse 6, a short distance away, that when the Philistines heard this noise of shout, they, they said, what does this sound of the great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? They understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. In verse 7 it says, so the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Verse 8, woe to us, who will deliver us from the hands of these mighty gods these are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all their plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. A short distance away, another army, the Philistine army, they hear this noise and, and they begin to ask themselves, what is this noise of shouting, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? The word Hebrews here is the Philistines, were, they didn't reference them as the Israelites, they referenced them as the Hebrews. Oftentimes in that time when the people of Israel were called Hebrews, it was used in a derogatory tone. They had just been defeated by the Philistines, so what did they have to shout about? What was their reason for this joy? What was this reason why they were shouting so loudly? They just lost 4,000 men. Why would they be shouting? When you look at the second part of verse 6, it says, the, then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. That word understood, the Philistines understood. That word understood means that they'd seen that they were able to see that the Ark of the Covenant came in. It must have been some type of profe uh, pro procession, but when it got to the, to the camp of the, Phil uh, to the Israelites, there was a great shout, enough to get their attention to ask, what does this mean? The reaction of the Philistines is a little bit of a surprise. They had just shown their military superiority, superiority over the Israelites, and, and now they're shouting, what does this mean? What does this actually mean? But look, the, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord 
has come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid. You know, it's interesting here about the Philistines. We should give them a little bit of a compliment here. Because they understood what the Ark of the Covenant meant. It tells us here that something like this, going into battle with us, something like this has never happened before. That's why they say to us in verse 7, for such a thing has never happened before. They have never brought the presence of the Lord with them into battle. Do we know that every time we go into battle, that the presence of the Lord is always with us? We don't wear, need to wear a necklace with a cross on it. We don't need to have not of this world stickers or not of this world t-shirt. We don't need to wear a hat that says Jesus. Yes, those are all cool things. But we don't need to go those in battle because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We already have the victory in Jesus Christ. We already have the armor of God. And, there, and the Philistines are saying that the, the presence of the Lord is here. They understood that that, the, that this ark represented the pres, uh, presence of God in, and we should compliment them a little bit more because in, in verse 8, it, they say woe to us. In verse 7 and verse 8, they say woe to us again and, and they understand the history of God. It tells us in verse 8 that these are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. They understood the history of our great Jehovah God. It was unusual for the Israelites to bring the, battle, the Ark of the Covenant into battle against the Philistines. And again, this is why they say, this has never happened before. When we see verse 8 again, it tells us that what God had done many years before against the Egyptians, the Philistines are, be, are aware of. And yet it references them to these mighty gods. Even though they didn't understand much about God, the Philistines recognized the superiority of God of, the, of Israel. And yet if the Philistines really understood who God was, then why didn't they submit to them? Why didn't they simply determine to fight against God all the more? If they really believed that their gods were greater than the God of Israel, then they shouldn't have been worried. Why would they have to say, woe to us? But like them, we as well often know God is greater and deserves our submission. Yet often we resist God as well instead of submitting to him. See, knowledge wasn't their problem. Submission to God was. And maybe we should, like the Philistines here, I mean, we, for us men, I, this is something I would address the men in this room. Something we can learn here from the Philistines in verse 9 is to be strong and conduct yourselves like men. I think a lot of men today have become snowflakes. We don't stand up for truth. We don't stand up for God's word. We don't stand up for the moral things that are right in the church today, let alone in the world. And I think a lot of times men have been taken the back seat and a lot of things that, oh, somebody else will do it. Men aren't stepping up in their marriages Men aren't step, stepping up in their jobs. Men aren't stepping up here in the church, not this church, but in the church in general. And if we can take something from the Philistines here, we are to be strong and conduct ourselves like men. God has given us his Holy Spirit. And he tells them in verse 9, Take courage and be men, Philistines, lest you become as the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Be men and fight. When we look at this, would this be considered... Bravery or stupidity on the hand of the Philistines because they're going to go up against the Ark of the Covenant of God. The godless Philistines can teach us something. Christians need to show more courage. Instead of giving up when things look bad, we should trust in the Lord and fight all the harder and decide that we will not give up. We won't give up for our families, we won't give up for our children. We won't give up for our loved ones. We will stand up and, be, and fight like men. And all of us need to understand this. That this isn't the time for us men to, to roll over. This is a time for us men to stand up and fight for our families. To stand up for the things of the Lord and fight in the power of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 tells us, So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. 
So do not fear, for I am with you, and do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. When it says in verse 9 that conduct yourselves like men and fight, but it says here that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you before. When you look in, in Judges chapter 13, verse 1, it tells us, again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So the Israelites had been slaves to the Philistines for many years. So what happens then? Well, this is what happens. Look at verse 10. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was victorious. Oh, wait, does your Bible say victorious? No, your Bible says defeated. They were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. And there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And also the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Didn't seek the Lord before going into battle. Didn't seek the Lord about bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the camp of going into battle. And had two scoundrels overseeing, worthless and corrupt men, overseeing the Ark of the Covenant of God. What do you think would happen? Do you think they would be victorious? Do you think there would be victory? Really? Do we think that when we don't seek God, we don't seek his holiness, we don't seek walking in his ways, we don't seek living in the ways and obedience of Jesus Christ that we're going to have a victorious life? No, we will be defeated. And what's interesting here is that 30,000 men died, seven times more than the previous battle, and they thought they were bringing God into the battle. They were using God as a gimmick. These Philistines were desperate and courageous. They, they stood up and they fought as desperate men. The Israelites felt the battle would be easy with the Ark of the Covenant there and, and didn't try as hard. And God did not bless Israel's superstitious belief in the power of the Ark instead of the power of God. And we can often make the same mistake, believing that if God is with us, we don't need to try very hard. Lord, you got this. You, you can go ahead and do it for me. Lord, I, I'm just going to sit in the back seat here and just, just cruise along. But you got this. We think that if God's on our side, that the work will be easy. And that's not true at all. As it turned out, God didn't feel obligated to bless the Israelites just because they took the Ark of the Covenant in a battle. He wouldn't allow his arm to be twisted by the superstitions of the Israelites. See, God is a person. He's not a, Jimmy, a genie nor a gimmick to be beckoned at the will of any man. And it tells us again here in verse 10 that 30,000 foot soldiers died. Not only did they lose their loss far worse than they did before taking the ark into battle, it tells us here that it was a great slaughter. Not only was the, these people killed in battle, the ark was captured, it tells us here in verse 11. And the two sons of, of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. What was crazy about this, or what's, what's worse about this, is the, the battle was bad. But the very thing that they thought would bring them victory was captured. The very thing that represented the presence of God was now captured by pagans. Yes, Israel made an idol of the Ark of God, and God deals with our idolatry by taking the idol away. You know, we can make good things idols. There was nothing wrong with the Ark of the Covenant itself. God commanded them to make it. It was an important piece to Israel. And he put in them, again, tablets of, uh, the tablets of the law, a jar of manna, and Aaron's rod that, that budded. It was inside the Ark. But yet, even a good thing like the Ark can be made an idol. 
and God won't tolerate our idols. This now ark that was the presence of God has now been taken by the pagan Philistines. And it's worth noting now, instead of being referenced as the ark of the God of host, whose presence dwells between the cherubim, is now just referenced as the ark of God. Fancy titles can hardly seem appropriate anymore. The presence of God is now gone from Israel because they did not seek the Lord. And they used gimmicks to try and bring victory only in victory where Jesus can bring. It was to beginning to look as the Philistines were more brave than they were stupid after all. In Psalm 70, verses 60 to 61, so, he that, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had placed among men, and delivered his strength in, into captivity and his glory into the hands, or the enemy's hands. The presence of the Lord has now departed from Israel. What was now once used as a, a gimmick to try to bring victory has now not only been, not only have they been defeated, but it has been captured by, by the enemy. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. You know, there's a terrible misunderstanding that we have when we, that we have seen is the thought that we can depend on the promises of God while paying no regard to his call in our lives. Something that we all need to be reminded of and to, and to always understand that we cannot put our trust in God's kindness towards you and Jesus Christ as the Israelites shouted with joy in the promises represented by the Ark of the Covenant and at the same time ignored God's demand for holiness in our lives. The truth we are seeing is here is that we cannot live, we cannot have Jesus Christ as Savior without having him as Lord over our lives. See, Jesus didn't die for you and I for him to be used as a gimmick. He died on the cross that we may have eternal life. He died on the cross that we may be set free from bondage and sin. He died on the cross that we may have a relationship with him. He died on the cross that we may have an abundant life in him. Why? Because he loves you. John 10.10 10 says the thief does not come except to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. See, Jesus died because he loves you. He never died for him to be used as a gimmick or to use religion or a method to get us through difficult times. He died that we may have life and life abundant. So whatever storm you're going through, Whatever difficulty you may be facing this morning or any crisis that you're going through, just understand that first and foremost, we need to seek the Lord. Secondly, he is not a gimmick for us to use. He is the holy God who created this world, who desires a relationship with you. This is the God that we serve. He's not a gimmick. He's a God that loves you a God that wants to speak with you, a God who wants to have a relationship with you, this is the God that one day you and I will say face, face, we'll see face to face. And our desire is that he will say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. Jesus is not a gimmick. He is Lord and Savior over this entire universe. He is the almighty God. 